That's right. We're upside down, but right side up. Welcome to another edition of Flashback to the Track, the podcast that takes you back to the track that you never thought you were at because you probably didn't watch the race. Well, if you didn't, that's cool. Then you get to learn something. If you did, we'll probably teach you something again. Um, James, Mark's with me on the other end. How you doing, Mark? I'm fantastic, James. How are you doing? Doing, doing pretty solid. Hope everybody else is doing well out there listening to another edition. It's a new year, new season of the podcast. You know, time to talk about some old racing. Got a lot of different topics we want to cover this year. Uh, but we want to try to talk about some stuff that like is just near and dear to our hearts as far as racing goes. You know, things we're really just passionate and, and fans about. That's the thing. And I think there's no better place to start this season, James, with with flipping everything upside down and going down under and talking about something that I've wanted to do for a while and we're finally here. We're gonna talk about the V8 Supercar Championship today, James. We're gonna go to Australia and talk about my favorite racing series. I'll say it, it's my favorite racing series. I'll go on the record saying that, my favorite racing. So Mark is a huge fan of V8 Supercars, as you can tell, he's a, uh... What it? What are you a pass holder of the streaming service too? Oh, I am. It's very affordable. It's fifty bucks a year for everything. And what is so, what is that called? Super View. Everything's super. View? It's super cars, super view, super everything. All right. So um, yeah, super cars. I mean, if you have not really heard of V8 supercars or of the Australian supercar series. Uh, or excuse me, the Australian Touring Car Championship, then don't worry. You probably don't live in either Australia or New Zealand for it to be the most popular form of motorsport in your region. I mean, in, in Australia and New Zealand, this is the like top level of motorsport. Um, it's like their NASCAR or Formula One equivalent. They love it. That's where the top of the top racing series goes. Like we said, it's the most premier series in Australia. They also travel to New Zealand, uh, going back and forth between both countries. They're right next to each other. And they race these touring cars based off of production model Australian cars uh, on road and street courses. And Mark, it's interesting you brought this up to me. I've never heard this in my life, but you brought it up to me before we started recording. Someone told you once that a touring car was the same as a V8 supercar. And I just had to look at you like you had three heads. I was like, who the, who said that? I mean, they're totally different. I'd say a supercar is like a, the, a touring car on steroids. You know what I mean? It's like the most aggressive touring car imaginable. And of course, it comes from one of the most aggressive places in the world, Australia. Yeah, and the thing that really makes supercars unique is that, like you said, that using cars that are native to Australia. Now, that's changed a little bit in recent years, but using the Holden brand, which is the GM, uh, like it's like Chevy in Australia, uh, and the Ford Falcon, which is a car that you can only buy in Australia. Uh, they've gone now to the Mustang and the Camaro. Um, so those brands aren't, aren't really represented anymore, but for years and years and years, that was the big thing that Aussies could really get behind was it was a, a series that used cars like built and designed in Australia. So, and it was just unique. I should have worn my Holden shirt, James. What the hell am I doing? I didn't even wear my Holden shirt today. But. I know. And you also called Holden's Chevrolet's. They were making them in the Pontiacs, man. That's what, I mean, if we're looking at those cars back in the day, technically the Holden's were the Pontiac before Pontiac went to, to rip. In, well, in it's now United since States been replaced in supercars with with chevy so that's what i should have said so so my bad on my yeah because holden it holden doesn't exist anymore just general motors destroyed holden and yeah they had some other uh, manufacturers you kind of mentioned earlier like uh nissan volvo mercedes they uh would come into the sport like uh over the last couple of years and it's been good to see that because like you know probably for the pride of australia that holden ford battle is like you know it stands the test of time in that country. It's like, you know, Ford versus Ferrari to some people or, you know, Chevy versus Ford here. You know, there's just that, those two sides that people are on and it's like, which is the best of the best? And they had the best proven ground for it, which was the supercar series to see which was the best of the manufacturers. Yeah, and that's just what makes, you know, supercar championship so great. When you see the races on TV, you see the fans with massive Ford flags, massive Holden flags, and they are just like, they're a fan of that brand. And that's just really cool to see. So it's very similar to Formula One in that way, where fans are a fan of a brand more so even than a driver sometimes. 
Um, so we'll do a little bit of Supercars 101 if you're not familiar with kind of how this series works. So it has a very unique schedule, uh, different types of events. So they have 125 kilometer sprint races, which are about an hour. They have some 250 kilometer races, which take about two hours. And they also have endurance races that have a co-driver involved. So normally it's a one driver series like NASCAR, but sometimes they'll add a co-driver for certain events. So uh, the series obviously most prestigious race is the Bathurst 1000, which is the endurance race uh, that last couple of years has been the finale, but usually it's about the fifth last race of the season. It's a few, few before the end. And that's at the Mount Panorama circuit in Bathurst, which of course is, you know, one of the most storied racetracks in the world. And they break their races down rather than having all individual races, they have rounds and they're, other than endurance races, rounds will feature multiple events in a weekend. So if a sprint round will have three of those 125 kilometer races, like one on Saturday, two on Sunday, and then they'll have like one mandatory pit stop just for tires. And then the 250 kilometer weekends, a normal distance race, they'll have one on Saturday and one on Sunday. And they'll usually have refueling in those races, a couple pit stops. And then of course they have the Enduros, which are much longer. So it's just unique in the way also that it has some of the most, like I would argue some of the world's top racing drivers that a lot of people just don't know about because they're from Australia and that's where they race, right? So uh, some of the best guys that have come over and raced in sports cars and other series and just been super fast, but they fly under the radar because they're literally under the radar. In any ways, they are the best drivers in Australia and New Zealand, and it's it shows, and it's a big world, so it's hard. Uh, I, I would like to see like which is the best driver, which which continent has the best driver. Be see to interesting to see like a, a competition to see who is the best geographical driver in the world, because I feel like they would the Australians would give the Finnish a good run for their money. Those fins on their ice, though, man, racing on ice is just like. It's a different breed, man. I feel like they're they're both different breeds, you know. You know what I mean? So I feel like they, they would be like, I don't know, they would get the best out of each other. They would. That would that, I, hey, that'd be something. I pay to watch a, that. Co, a co-driver who's a Finn and the other co-driver is Australian. So. Every 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 Australian in the Bathurst 1000 must have a Finnish co-driver. New rule for 2022. You heard it here first. Uh let's talk about the broadcast a little bit, James. So the broadcast in supercars is like world renowned for just be having like a very high quality broadcast that's modeled very much after F1 and just the way that they call the action and, and inform the viewer of things, but they also just like have fun and there's some humor between the commentators. And the big thing, James, is the unique camera angles. Like they just get you so close to the action. I feel like it's better than Formula One because, you know, unlike Formula One, you know, when you have one, outlet for everything it it i think it cleans up the program and allows it to be much more lighthearted and humorous and unique in its own way but like just so personable with how much access they give you uh from you know the in-depth audio uh when they plug it in to hear team communication and team orders to just the in-depth angles of the pits i love seeing the behind the scenes when you see behind the box and you see the engineers working and, and calculating things with the race strategists love those shots uh and they have offer those and then probably some of the coolest things that they had during this race loved crane shots it took a lot of effort to set those up outside the corners but those crane shots add so much depth and that makes me think of a formula one broadcast especially like if you think of like certain races where they go to hairpins super tight low and as they come through the corner they pan out and go wide and you see the crowd in the corner as they hit the apex it's so beautiful it really sets the the scene and they have so many beautiful settings to go to to do this so the broadcast team does an amazing job and the feel of the race too not just to mention the atmosphere of the track have feeling how fast those cars are going with the gopher cam on the bottom and ball cam with the super cheap auto little decals everywhere just love it and you really see uh how close the drivers get to the walls which is insane you think there would be a lot more proximity you know such a long race and consequences on a street course are so real but these drivers eat up track limits they are using every available inch and then some it's insane and, and it's great that the broadcast showcases this 
Today's race is going to be on broadcast channel seven network. Remember seven network from that beautiful 1993 Australian Grand Prix coverage. Oh, they do such a great job. We have the legendary supercar voice of Neil Crampton, former driver himself, and five-time supercars champion, My Mark Skyf. And he'll be joined by Matthew White, who's going to be the play-by-play -play color commentator. And now Matthew, he doesn't have that driver experience that Neil and Mark have, but I think that really balances it out when you have those two drivers to give that insight and then you have that middleman to break it up and add some humor. That's the thing is having someone who can really like just, you know, call what they're seeing on the track. And then you get that insight from a five-time champion <clears throat> and then Neil Crompton as well. And nowadays it's just Crompton and Scaife by themselves and they call the race like they're good to go. So, but back then they did the three commentator thing and in the lane, down in the line, uh, we have Mark Larkham, who's just like the veteran, a pit reporter, former driver who teaches us all the aspects of supercars tech. He does He's kind of like Larry Mack down, you know, down there, giving us all the tech segments as well as being a pit reporter. And back then he just had a whiteboard to write stuff on. Now he has like a fancy, like tell like the crazy TV board where he can like tell us straight. Uh, and he'll be joined by veteran supercars reporter, Mark Beretta and Mark, those two guys, the Marks, Mark squared. They're going to handle things down in the pit Actually, lane. Yeah, yeah. Mark, Mark to the third power. If you also you know count the booth. It's true. Yeah. Marks we're coming yeah. for you. We're taking over the world. They are technically marked men. Uh, so on this particular round of competition, it's round three of the 2011 international V8 supercars championship. Man, that sounds so official. Um, but it's like rounds, it's race five. So it's round three, but I'm guessing it's race five and six of the yes. season. The first two rounds had two races each as well. So I think it really adds value to the whole event when you have like a weekend with coverage. So like, you know, come one day, come both days, you're not getting robbed either way. You get to see two races for the price of one every weekend, except, well, except Bathurst, you're only seeing one, but every other race on the calendar, you're getting two for one. And this is the ITM Hamilton 400 at the Hamilton street circuit in, let me say it again, Hamilton, New Zealand. So this is a very unique circuit, James. And uh, we'll, we'll say the first two races of the year, uh, this is the international supercars championship because they kicked the race off at, or the season off at Abu Dhabi at the Yas Marina circuit. Uh, and the second round was the classic Clipsal 500 in Adelaide. And this 2011 uh, season, James, marks the fourth year that the Supercars is going to race at the Hamilton Street Circuit. Nine turn, 3.3 or 2.2 mile street course. It's got very tight corners and not a lot of room for errors. So it's like a good classic street course in that way. You, you pay dearly for your mistakes, as you should. Track limits are the wall. So don't hit them. What do you mean the wall? There's so much painted stuff on the ground. It's like, wow, there's this track is super slick. Um, a lot of curbage too. And you can't eat too much of those curbs because, you know, Mark, they will give you a penalty. I thought that was really interesting that they had markers where the curbing was to see where the track limits were and actually give drivers penalties for that. Not just sacrificing the race car, but actually penalizing them and giving them like uh, pit road pass-throughs. Bad sportsmanship flag. You only get so you. I think you can do it three times, and then you get a bad sportsmanship flag. And if you do it again, it's a drive-through penalty. So, yeah, they, they police it pretty well. It's a, it's it's good. It's a good policing system. Um, and then so far at the Hamilton Circuit, the only two drivers to have won there are Garth Tanner and Jamie Winkup, both who are heavy favorites to repeat. So. If, if we listen to the experts in 2011, Mark, no one else is going to win today. It's going to be one of those two guys. Well, speaking of drivers, James, let's go into some notable starters for this one. And I'll kick us off. We have Jamie Wincup driving the number 88 team Holden, sorry, team Vodafone Holden Commodore for triple eight race engineering. 88, 88, man, for the triple eight. I always loved how many eights that team had in their lineup. Yeah, I, like all the eights. But then when they added the third car, it wasn't number eight. Lame. Should have been eight, 88, triple eight. But this is the GOAT himself, James. This is Jamie Winnicott. He is now a seven-time Supercars champion. 
At the time, though, back in 2011, he was hunting for his third championship. And he comes into the race five as a heavy favorite, as you already mentioned. He won the last four races at Hamilton. And he's also going to start from the pole position. And when Cup's driving for the, the Holden Powerhouse Triple Eight Race Engineering, the team that he wins all seven of his titles with, and fun fact, having retired after the 2021 season, Wincup is now the team principal at Triple Eight. So he's still involved in racing, just uh, not driving anymore. He can't get out of the sport completely. And unless you're, unless you're Carl about Edwards. Someone... Oh, I will, sorry, I want to make a Carl Edwards joke. Sorry. Uh, no, he, he's smart. He's able to get out of, get out of the limelight completely. Uh, next up, we're going to talk about uh, owner driver, Rick Kelly, the number 15 Jack Daniels racing Holman Commodore for Kelly racing. Now, Rick Kelly is the 2005 supercars champion, and now he's going to head into Hamilton looking for his first win with his racing team. It's been two years since he started with his team with his brother, Todd in 2009 and they are still winless now kelly currently sits ninth in the point standings coming into this event but he's still very alive in the championship with how many rounds there are left in the season and the variability of what can happen can rick kelly get kelly brothers their first win in his own equipment at hamilton he's going to come rolling off with third position can the kellys finally do it Next up is Shane Van Giesbergen, the local boy, driving the number nine SP Tools Ford Falcon for Stone Brothers Racing. And he's the only Kiwi driver in our notable uh, driver's list. Uh, SVG, who's now a two-time Supercars champion, was still a young pup, 21 years old back in 2011, searching for his first win still. He arrived in the scene in 2007 when he was 18. He started driving in supercars, and he's been so close to victory so many times, but just hasn't gotten over the hump yet. Naturally, he's a fan favorite at Hamilton because he is from New Zealand, and the local fans would love to see a Kiwi driver take a win on home soil, and he's rolling off from the fourth position. And you can only call people from New Zealand a Kiwi. Don't call an Australian a Kiwi. It'll, it'll get ugly. Next up, Craig Lowndes in the number triple eight team Vodafone Holden Commodore for triple eight racing. Yeah, that's right. The triple eight. That's always one of my favorite numbers. It just stood out. It was the only triple icon number I remember back in the day from V8 supercar racing. Just so cool. Um, now, it wouldn't be supercars racing without talking about the legendary Craig Lowndes. He's a three-time champion of supercars and a seven-time Bathurst 1000 winner. So he is just one of the best to have ever strapped in to an Australian touring car. Now, in 2011, Lowndes is still hunting for his elusive fourth championship. It's funny. For Jeff Gordon, it was an elusive fifth championship. But after winning three titles in the late 90s, he's been dry throughout the 2000s man it's like terry labani kind of you know like he gets that those championships and just dry for the rest of the for rest of the time maybe he'll come back and win another one but obviously history has proven that he doesn't now he's looking for his first victory of the 2011 season he's got a good shot because he's rolling off in a top five starting position in fifth that's half the battle in these races i feel like is like a lot of attrition you know what i mean well, street courses, especially like you got to start up front. Like it's very difficult. These are longer races. So some strategy can work out for you, but those sprint rounds they have, man, if you don't start up front, like it's going to be very tough to get, you know, to the front of the, the, you know, to lead the race. So, you know, yeah. And the only, well, I was going to say the only comparison I'd make with touring cars with this is like the elbows up mentality of the racing. Like there is like, it's my position. You need, you will have to take that for me. And that's what it takes to sometimes make a move happen. And you'll see a lot of that in this race, like guys just knowing where to park the car in the corner so nobody can get by them. That's such a big skill in supercar racing with how big these cars are, you know, and the best guys, yeah, contact co contact is welcome in supercar it, racing. It, it is. Now you got to be careful. You can't dump someone for the win, but you can, you can get your elbows you up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, next up we have Garth Tanda, Gath Tanda. Driving the number two Rockstar Energy Drink Holden Commodore for the Holden Racing Team, the factory team. So mm -hmm. that's probably one of my favorite teams, Mark. It's the Toll Holden Commodore team, man. I just love their look back in the day and the big Rockstar logos on the on the front. Uh, 2010, though, I'm gonna say is my favorite year. That white car, dude, it oh, so much, so beautiful. And the great thing about Garth Tander, so when he won his championship, he drove for the 
B Holden team, the HSV dealer team. And mm. after that, they moved them up to the big team. So kind of like a Red Bull Toro Rosso type thing, but he was with the B team, won the 2007 championship. And he's no slouch man when it comes to Hamilton, because he won both races there in 2008. And he's known for his prowess on street circuits. He's won at Adelaide, Townsville, and Surfers Paradise a bunch of times on top of his wins at Hamilton. And he's going to roll off from the sixth position today. And finally, on our notable starters list, we're going to have to talk about Mark Winterbottom, the number five Oregon Steel Ford Falcon. This is one of the few Falcons we're going to talk about in this lineup for Ford Performance Racing. Uh, our final notable starter, a.k.a. Frosty Mark Winterbottom. I mean, what a what a nickname right there. He's driving number five Ford Falcon. Frosty has been a serious contender for over a decade in supercar racing, was in the thick of the title fight again in 2011. It's like he gets better with age. He's not the kind of guy who tends to win more than like four or five races a season. So he's just always racking him up, but he's consistently just finds a way to like get at the top of the points table throughout the season. Like when the season's over, his name is in the competition for the final standings. So he's starting the furthest back though of the notable starters. 11th now how many cars total are in the field again mark uh good question this 27 cars in the race that, that tells you like 11th is pretty far back like you're in a 27 car field which is it's pretty big field for a street course I and mean, you're already pretty far back so yeah. strategy is going to have to come into play here and to go into the pre pre-race notes mark to kind of set it up a little bit like we said it's race five 200 kilometer race, total of 59 laps. The biggest thing to throw into your strategy now is that there's rain in the forecast and it's sprinkling a little bit, Mark. Um, here's the question. Do you stay on slicks or do you change over to wets? Because if you change over to wets at this point and if you didn't get it before you get on the grid, you have to start the race from pit lane. Yeah, so there is, that's the discussion. I think everyone in this race decides to start on slicks because there's not enough moisture to risk running on wet tires. Cause I think the Delta, if you were, if you went out on a wet tire, you'd be seven or eight seconds a lap slower and you'll be yeah, lapped like, before the rain comes. The track is like just damp right now. And eventually a dry line will form once the race gets started. So it's not like there's really any even standing water on the track to really help cool those rain tires down and you burn right through them. And, this, and these are the best race dri car drivers in Australia, James, and New Zealand. So, you know, they're going to start on slicks and they're going to be just fine. So let's get into our race notes. We'll preface this race by saying we don't talk about these a lot on there, but they do a standing start. So they are going to start in box, just like Formula One, that Grand Prix style of racing. They're going to start the, the green flag waves and the lights go out and Rick Kelly gets a massive jump from third spot. He takes the lead. They go three wide into turn one. There's not a lot of room out there. And pole sitter, Jamie Wincup, he gets shuffled back to fifth by turn two. So he has to just get out of the gas. He gets shoved out to the outside. And after one lap, James, Rick Kelly has pulled out a nearly two second gap on the field. He has, but you can see that there's a mist coming up as the pack works their way around the track. That's because of the dampness on the track. Everybody on the slick tires making their way around. There's a lot of close calls, a lot of bumper tag in the top 10 as a jockey for position. Eventually, Steven Johnson is an early victim as he is struggling to find grip. And then he eventually gives up second to the local favorite, Shane Van Gibsmer. Meanwhile, Ray Kelly still driving away, Mark. And now he's up to four seconds up the road, but the SVG is turning quick laps to track him down, man. It's not, it's never over. SVG, he's not, you know, this is his kind of conditions. He's a drift driver as well. He does drifting and off-road stuff. You know, give him those slicks on a wet racetrack. And, you know, those young guys, they don't know when to slow down. They just go fast. So, so on lap nine, we see your boy Frosty. He's on the move, James. He started 11th. He's now up to 7th as he gets around Greg Murphy in that Pepsi Max car. Intr Love that livery, though, on that Pepsi Max car. It's so edgy. It's so of the time. It, you know what? You don't need to say diet soda. You just need to say that it's the max of soda. That's how you get people to buy it. Meanwhile, the battle for third is heating up as Garth Tanner and Jamie Wincup begins duel. J-Dub. 
as we like the column, is all over the back of the number two. But Tanner is just parking that car perfectly, just stopping the momentum that Jamie has in the middle of the corner, keeping him behind him, and he gets the launch off and gets the, the jump down the straightaways. Classic tactic right there. Now lap 12, Wayne, James, we're going to start to see some early green flag pit stops. So Craig Lowndes and James Courtney are both going to come in, but I don't see any wet tires in the pit lane, James. They're putting more slicks on as the rain has yet to arrive. And there it is. The rain is starting to come down right as they pull into their pits, but they still put slicks on. And now as it starts to rain a little bit heavier, Shane Van Giesbergen's in pit lane and he cannot get his car stopped and he slides right through his pit box and knocks over the seven channel camera operator. Scary stuff down in the pits, but he's up quickly back on the job, gives us a thumbs up and no harm done. But even with the rain, there's still more slick tires going on all these cars, James. So I guess they still don't think that it's enough rain for wets, or maybe it's not raining on the whole track. Maybe it's only raining on the front stretch. Now, here's my question for what these teams do to prepare the pit box. Well, they mentioned in the broadcast that there is a lot of grip tape, similar to the style of grip tape you'd see on a skateboard. I think it's just like this, the same uh, grit of like a, of a paper tape, but it's like in a roll, but they have it lining the pit box. And you've seen a lot of grand, grand touring style racing and, 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 and Grand Prix racing. Do they get to like, clean the box of the water squeegee it out a little bit because you know other than the driver backing up you know five or ten feet from their braking zone and initially to get into the box like how else could they try to prepare the box so it's dry enough for the driver to get in there that's the thing and the other thing too is just the change of surface so when they go the pit lane is asphalt when they pull into the the pit garage like box an f1 style box right those are concrete so it's a completely different surface as they pull onto it. And the guys just, I guess, weren't prepared for that in the rain. And you just see so many guys slide through. And you hear Mark Scaife just freaking out. He's like, wow, they just slow down more. Tell them to slow down. But you got to, you can't lose time in the pits, James. Got to just, you know, get in there. Speaking of losing some serious time, Jamie Wincup is losing serious time. He is back behind the wall in the garage area. He's got some serious damage. And Mark, it's because he tried to get a little too much coming out of the pits. He tries to dab that throttle a little bit. The car comes around from him. He saves it, but unfortunately tags the outside wall. Literally the last jersey barrier before the end of the pit road. That's a bummer. It's going to destroy the, the right, left front steering arms. Me, uh, The team is able to repair it in five laps. Great job by them. But Unfortunately, being more than two laps down, they are definitely out of contention for this race. And these pit stops, James, they've worked out great for Rick Kelly as he had a perfect pit stop, didn't slide through his box. And most of the guys he was racing all had trouble. So especially Stephen Johnson. And we're going to talk about Stephen Johnson, unfortunately, a lot in this one. So he stayed out to survey the conditions. They're going to wait a little bit longer. And he got turned by Mark Winterbottom, who just overshot a corner because he's on slicks on a wet racetrack. And now some of those cars that ran longer are all starting to come in for wet weather tires. It's too wet for slicks right now. Too wet. It's pouring, man. Look at that. looks like Vietnam when you're looking at pit road. Jesus, a wall of water. <laughs> and, and speaking of wall of water, now there's a wall of cars coming down pit road. This is just going to work out perfectly for the guys who ran long and then took wets on their first stops. Because now the conditions for the track are playing right into their favor. Yeah. They're like a pit stop ahead now. So mm -hmm. now James, we're going to be treated to some of the craziest hijinks you're ever going to see on a pit road. So Rick Kelly comes back in for wets and he almost bins his car entering the pit lane. Like this is remarkable. This slow-mo footage they show, how did he get it stopped and not hit the wall? He's skating on ice. You know why? Like. He never looked at that tire barrier in front of him. That's the thing. It's like, look where you want to go. That's what they teach if, you yeah. in driving school. Right. Now, they don't even teach it in that driving school. <laughs> it's just <laughs> instinct. And that's what, yeah. what Kelly did. And he was just skating towards the right, towards that wall of tires. And he just barely gets it correctly back to the left, shifts back to the right. And then he's on pit road. Though, unfortunately, Mark, there are a couple of drivers who aren't so lucky because there's a stack up of cars on the pit entry including Russell Ingle and 
Shane Van Giesberg. His troubles are just continuing. Now we have a local yellow waving on the pit road entry, but it's getting a little crazy, man. Even with those flags, there's still too many people coming in there hot, and the stewards are not going to like that. Yeah, they're not too happy with Shane Van Giesberg and barreling through there with yellow flags. No. But can't get a stop, man. Like, and back to the on-track action. Well, so, sorry, go ahead. What I, I was going to say, there, the stewards reported that there was oil on the pit road. I don't know if that was before the incident or afterwards because, you know, there was some damaged race cars that probably dropped fluid after the fact. But before, was that the contributing factor to this? Or was everybody just getting on a pit road way too hot, getting a little too much in that area? Cars are running wide everywhere, ducking down escape roads. The rain has made driving nearly impossible. We get an onboard look. This is an incredible shot, James. I've never seen this before. We're in his pedal box looking up at him. So we're like, we're the pedals for this shot. And it shows how difficult, how much he has to feather the throttle and the brake during these conditions. He's in full tap dance mode and he's in the fence. So we get to ride with him while he's now put it into the wall. Fortunately, it's just a minor incident. He gets it going again. So even the top drivers in this series are struggling to keep their cars on track with full wet tires. Like it is just undrivable conditions. Yeah. And James Courtney is no slash. So for him to go off like that, you know, it's just the smallest of mistakes in a, in a very dangerous situation where like, you know, you know, the smallest of mistakes lead to something happening. He's the reigning champion. He's the reigning champion. (laughs) <laughs> so yeah. Yeah. Well, fortunately for the reigning champion he hit the tire wall and not the concrete wall that was four feet further down so but a little further down the road mark we get a safety car the first safety car of the event is out and it's for a big incident involving tim slade in turn one mark the scariest thing you could see in racing is when someone almost loses their brakes going into a very fast corner and turn one is probably one of the fastest parts of the track. They're all going over 200 kilometers entering that corner and it looks like he just skids right through heading towards the concrete wall. Fortunately, he hits the tire wall and it does an amazing job to help slow him down before he meets that concrete wall. Yeah, Crazy it's, remar- stuff. it's remarkable footage. Like you just see him in the slow mo when they show him, he hits that wall, and it just takes so much inertia off of the car before he does eventually make contact with a concrete wall, and he's able to walk away on completely unscathed. It's incredible. He needs new pants though, and we'll get it to him. <laughs> it's insane. Back to the green flag on lap thirty-one. The racetrack is still very slick and wet. The running order is all over the place due to some teams taking some extra pits, making some extra pit stops for wet tires. No one really can make it to the end on fuel quite yet, but Rick Kelly is effectively the net leader running back in 10th position. Mark, explain that. How is he the net leader? So what we mean by that is, so he pit under the safety car uh, and essentially the way it works since he, they believe he'll be able to make it to the end on fuel everyone in front of him still owes us another pit stop. So technically, if everything cycles through properly, he should be the leader. So he's not the leader on paper, but he should be the leader if everything works in his favor. But that's a long way to go on fuel. And we'll chat about that in a little bit, but it's just treacherous out there. You can't see anything like it. it, The thing in this, James, is it's not just that the, the track is wet and it makes it hard to drive. It's the spray coming off the other cars in front of you and just blinding you. Like you can't see anything. You're basically just driving on instinct at that point. Yeah, that windscreen wiper doesn't do jack when you've got a wall of water that's just coming up at you. And with the way these cars suck air off the bottom, you're just sucking a whole lot of the rooster tail up. And they're they're running close together, so it's impossible. You see some guys duck in and out just slightly off to the right, just trying to make sense of anything that's coming to them uh, next on the on the track. Nearing lap 40, the discussion in the commentary booth now, It's all about fuel mileage and let's start talking about it. Rick Kelly and Todd Kelly and Jason Barguana. Now they all pitted under that safety car on lap 29. This is what Mark was talking about being the net leaders. They are really the closest ones to making it to the end without stopping again for fuel. Frosty and the current leaders will likely have to stop again. Now they're all staying they're all saying they need to do another fuel stint in the wet. And it's 
you can get a couple more laps in the wet than you can on the dry. I think it's like two or three more technically. That's what they're discussing because you drive slower in the wet. So naturally you should yeah, use shell. less fuel, right? So yeah, not only you're driving slower, but you're backing, you're back, trying to back up your braking corner. You're not using as much brake, your, your throttle, you're, you're, you're leading off with the throttle and trail braking in. So it's like a lot of, a lot of opportunities, like you're saying, to save fuel in, in a wet lap than you can on the dry. Now by lap 45, the range is, is continuing to bucket down. It's just, it's really interesting how this is going from dry to wet to, to kind of dry to just like Vietnam wet again. Yeah, just so storming the wet. Like the conditions are all over the place on this on, during this race right now. Yeah, we get another spin from Dean Fiore. So he spins at slow speed coming onto the front stretch and turns around and the and the drivers are on the radios begging their engineers to call race control and, and tell them to, to throw the safety car because they can race in the rain, James, but they can't, they can't race in rain like this. This is just ridiculous. It's insane. But much to the dismay of the drivers, race control says, you guys are the best in the world. Stay out there. Keep, keep going. So... We're going to stay green. They do stay green. And now some of the leading cars, they're starting to come into the pits for their final fuel stops. Meanwhile, Marco Caruso and David Reynolds make heavy contact in turn three, but they both get it right. In. They both keep going. That's what I love about this race. And you make some contact, get it straightened up and keep on, keep it on. Mark Winterbottom, now he's on lap 49. Uh, and he's going to make his fuel stop. And now he's going to cycle behind Jason Baguana. And that's for the fifth position. So Winterbottom goes from the lead to fifth with his stop. Rick Kelly now has retaken the lead. But the big question is, does his Jack Daniels hold and have enough fuel to make it to the end? He has a huge gap, a 10-second lead. So there's a lot of room for him to give up some time feathering his throttle, saving some fuel. So there's opportunity. But Mark, it's funny. Rick's brother, Todd, now runs in the second position, both on the same strategy out of the four-car team, one-two right now on the track. If this works, it could be a massive day for Kelly Racing to get a one-two finish and their first victory. But Mark, is Todd's windscreen wiper working? Yeah, it's it's not working uh, super not well. Working. But to go back to Winterbottom's pit stop, this is a big deal because of the situation they're in. Frosty can't take tires. He doesn't have time. He's just taking a splash of fuel. So this has worked out great for people like Kelly because you don't even have the, you know, to worry about a guy on fresh tires behind you because he has to stay on his old tires. So it worked out pretty well. And now it's real drama time, James, because the safety car is out on lap 53. Not for the rain, but for a small piece of sheet metal debris on the front stretch. So that's half someone's door, man. That's someone's yeah. passenger side door. It was off the racing line. It was fine. This will give the fuel gamble guys, Rick Kelly and his brother, Todd, and those guys, they should now definitely have enough fuel to make it to the end, but it's bunched the field back up. And now a very hungry Mark Winterbottom is going to be very close to where they are. So Let's see what happens here. We get a crazy restart. There's water spray everywhere. Rick Kelly, he's going to maintain the lead through turn one while his brother Todd, who doesn't have a working windscreen wiper, he's really struggling because he just cannot see anything. He slips back to third place. Yeah, and he is just harping over the radio. I can't see. I can't see. Well, you got a battle, dude. You got a battle. And him and Winterbottom, dude, have amazing battle to the end insanely crazy what they are able to do but the sun is shining a bit the rain is still pouring but it's not truly raining on rick kelly's parade as he's able to hold off cred lounds and take the victory but most importantly dude his todd holds off for third that was quite a battle man i thought he lost third with two to go coming to the white flag but I don't know how he was able to maintain position going into that corner. What was that turn six when he made that pass back on Winterbottom, dude? Insane. 
Yeah, Winterbottom just went wide and Todd was able to get back by him. And the then the crazy, the slightest bit of wide too. The crazy like, thing too is it's sunny on half the racetrack, those last two laps. And then there's glare off the rain on the circus. I can't see anything. And they're just driving that like, hey, it's only over in a lap. Let's just get to the end. But like you said, Rick Kelly, man, he's, he holds on. He takes the win in race five, the Hamilton 400. And it's the first win for Kelly racing and his brother Todd comes home in third. They get both Jack Daniels cars on the podium, but unfortunately James for the Kelly boys, they can't party too hard tonight because they have another race tomorrow. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what sucks about winning race one. You can't go too hard and enjoy it, but it's really cool to see that seriously amazing battle for third. I was just an amazing two laps. I'm glad they really focused on what was happening there and understanding that Rick probably had the victory you know, barring anything crazy happening and to focus on really what was the true action on the track. Commend uh, Pete Supercar for that. That was really good coverage on that end of that race. And that's sometimes these, these wet weather races, they're some of the most enjoyable to watch because there's so much unknown and you can get something like a Rick Kelly winning the race, you know, and, and that's the great thing, but it's not like he, he, he didn't luck into it. Like we said, he had a very fast race car. So, but Todd on the podium with him, I can't remember where Todd, started in this race he started 19th and he finished third so you know mm-hmm. they they ran that with no windscreen well yeah and he couldn't see a damn thing the whole time so yeah. no windscreen wiper so insane for for him to to do that just, i can't believe he made that pass just i don't know how much room he needed but like there wasn't much room there in in to to, to tuck underneath him and then go and make that pass with third just insane i still can't get over that just a good feel good story, James. And, and let's go kind of into what, what did, what did we learn from this one? What did you learn, James? What did you learn? Um, I learned again that this was the first year that all rounds of V8 supercar action were televised on speed channel. <laughs> this was the first year that they did it. And they had like, I think they did the Bathurst thing with Mike Joy and Daryl wall trip. So some of these rounds I do remember, I don't remember this one vividly, but you know, learning again, how, uh intense a lot of this racing the strategy is what it is it's 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 fun to follow but i think the racing itself speaks volumes about how different this series is versus a lot of other forms of racing with um sportsmanship flags the way they lean and rub on each other but still show a lot of respect towards each other on the track the racing is just cutthroat but beautiful at the same time uh, and the coverage is amazing. So always fun to learn that. Um, and I learned that this was one of the few rounds that just, I don't know, this track didn't last long for the, for the series. Like, you know, it had a couple races, uh, lasted a few seasons, but then it was gone. Kind of, kind of a cool track. I like these like, uh, street temporary circuits, you know, really brings a lot to the place. Probably everyone who's Zealand loved this foot race. So I thought it was really cool. Learned a lot from it. What about you, Mark? Yeah, interesting track, kind of a small market track, Hamilton. They went back to Puka in 2013, which is the big track in New Zealand. I learned, James, that supercars always delivers. They just always deliver. It's always a compelling race. And it's there's just something about it that I just find so endearing. Like you said, action-packed. I learned, I learned that it's very rare to end one of these races having both of your side mirrors. They usually get bashed off either a corner exit or by another car. So, and I learned that uh, the Kelly racing boys, while they build fast race cars, they got to build working windscreen wipers for all four of their cars, not just three of them. So basically I just continued to learn that supercars is baller and that I highly recommend checking out the supercars championship. It's a lot of fun. Exactly. Go look at some old supercar races that are all all on YouTube. There's some really good ones. They upload them to their own YouTube channel, but a couple every week they're back into the mid nineties now with uploading races. So free to free to watch and check them out. James, if you had to rate this one, what would you, what ranking would you give it out of 10? I'd give it an eight. I think it's, it's a, it's a longer race for two hours. I like their sprints more. Uh, I, 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 and the, the sprints are, are more fun. Some of the Enduros are cool, like the Bathers and of course, Gold Coast. Uh, but you know, and, and that's maybe, maybe, uh, me more being, uh, critical in, in the touring car sense. I just like that 
style of it where it's just like quick races, you know, you make a mistake, you know, it, it's probably the end of your race, you know, qualifying does matter. Track position is key. Uh, and, and then just the style of racing is just otherworldly to see elbows up leaning on each other, the way they lean on each other and not wreck is insane. So just an eight, just always, always a good time with eight supercars. I'm also going to give it an eight. I'm not going to go I, like it's, it's close to a nine. I feel like the wet weather definitely adds something, but we, we are kind of robbed of like a classic, like balls to the wall with everyone going super hard types type street race. Like you get usually at Adelaide or, or surface paradise. So it is a solid race and we get the surprise winner. We get Rick Kelly. Uh, I'm not sure that he didn't win much more in his career after that. Um, I think he only- no, he, he, grabbed, he, grabbed, he grabbed like three more, two more wins that year. And then one more win in 20 years later. And that was it. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. So, so yeah, not often from like when he formed the team to the end of his career, did he really like have a lot of victories? Yeah. And the Kelly's actually uh, after the 2021 season just sold their team. So they're no longer involved in supercars. Uh, so they finally, uh, sold off the team, but they did actually a couple years later go on to become one of the coolest teams in supercars because they ran the Nissans. They were a Nissan yeah. Motorsport factory Nissan team. Those cars, they weren't super fast, but they were so cool looking. They had the Norton antivirus cars and the Jack Daniels cars, and they looked bad. I still remember the number 360 Norton antivirus car, which was just such a cool race car. So they were an awesome team. They gave a lot of drivers uh, opportunities that may not have other otherwise had opportunities and didn't win a lot, but they were, they were really cool race teams. So yeah, supercars is great. There's so many good stories in supercars. There's so many compelling, you know, just compelling driver stories to tell. And that's why it's just such a fun series to watch. I think it, the biggest thing for people to take away from this is, is really how small your world can be. And, and by that, I mean, like when you look at things in your lens, the depth of your lens is sometimes as far as what you see and what you interact with in your life. If you've never been exposed to something like this, you don't know it's out there. You don't know that there's these drivers driving at this level and, and competing in a series that is this insane. So, you know, the biggest thing is to always broaden your perspective, be open-minded to taking things like this. Cause like, you know, a lot of people, they are fans of what they like and they like it. You know, I'm an indie car fan, indie car, dad, oh, I like dirt cars, ah, oh, NASCAR, drag racing. That's cool. But have a, an ability to like have a, a, a broader palette, you know, ingest some different things. Cause like Speed Channel was the hugest influence for me to be exposed to supercars. I remember like being a kid in the mid 2000s and the summers and you'd have these races come up and they were just so different and foreign. And from a kid who was just used to watching NASCAR, it was like a really big exposure to something cool. And I think this really helped foster a relationship that I loved with touring car racing and DTM racing. And, you know, it started with V8 supercar though. So like let something expose you and broaden your world so that you see more to it because like we said these are some of the best drivers in the world but you know to many people they don't know who what Aust australian v8 supercars is but if you go to australia or new zealand this is the top sport this is the end all be all and you better know about it so it's pretty cool to see how the world works and what's popular in other parts of the world versus here and there you know yeah and i've never shown someone supercars or, or told them about it and had them not like it. They, everyone has watched and been like, wow, this is incredible. And, and when we talked about the broadcast, like we said, it's, it's just world renowned for, for being what it is and being a, as good a broadcast as it is where they have fun, they respect the viewer's knowledge level, but they still inform you of things. So it's just, a, in, just an all around great series to watch, great drivers, great group of people that run everything. And yeah, check out, if you wanna watch it and you don't live in Australia, they have a streaming package or you can join their YouTube channel for five bucks a month and they show everything there. So for $5 a month, you can watch all the supercars races. Highly recommend checking it out. It's a lot of fun. And I really enjoyed this review, James. This was a lot of fun. It was cool to finally, you know, take, take a deep dive on a supercars event like this one, a unique supercars event, the Hamilton street circuit. Yeah, that was a good one. And uh, watch motorsports on Reddit, get it for free. 
R slash motorsport streams. There's Watch, like there's, there's like there's SWAT there's guys some... going to come through these windows now. Yeah. Uh, there's there's so many cool ways to watch this the, the series. It's, you know, get access to it. You know, you can, you can go as hard as Mark and like you know really dive in and, and love it and watch it week to week or just be as casual as me and just you know what's going on. You're like, all right, I'm gonna watch Supercar Race now. So it's a cool series. Broaden your horizon. Check it out. Learn a little more about some uh, touring car racing. So I liked it, Mark. Stock car racing in its truest form. Yes, sir. Well, that is all for us today on the Flashback to the Tribe podcast. Thank you to our partners at Blue Emu for helping us out with everything that they do for us. It's fantastic. I've got my Blue Emu right here. I've also got a cat that's whining at me. Be sure to check out the Continuous Spray. This is probably my favorite. Other than the bath, this is my favorite Blue Emu product because you just spray it right on. You don't have to get your hands dirty, James. But even if you do get it Mm. on your hands, it's not greasy and you won't stink because it has no odor. And it works fast. There you go works fast you won't stay that's their motto isn't it i believe so there we go well we'll probably have something figured out again for everyone next time something we like but you know what it'll always be a a, a fun adventure with us we'll take you on the flashback to the track i guess that's how we'll end it this time (laughs) we'll see you next time be safe out there that's the big one take care guys